So good afternoon and thank you for joining us for Open Democracy, one of two events this week celebrating Open Access Week. My name is Verletta Kern, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Digital Scholarship Librarian with the UW Libraries in Seattle. As we get settled, I'd encourage you to take a moment to introduce yourself and say hello in our chat pod. It's always nice to see who's attending and um, for our presenters to know who, who's around. Um, as I mentioned earlier, today's program is part of our larger Open Access Week celebration. Uh, International Open Access Week is a coordinated annual effort by scholarly communities across the world to celebrate both our achievements and aspirations in making openness the default for research. This year's theme, Open with Purpose, Taking Action to Build Structural Equity and Inclusion, is especially relevant to this moment in time as we approach an upcoming election and we reflect on how to build equitable systems of knowledge sharing to further democratic processes. Today's panel will take a cross-disciplinary look at approaches to open democracy. I want to start with a couple of housekeeping items before we jump into our fantastic program today. We want to start by acknowledging that those of us hosting this session are doing so on Duwamish and Stillaguamish land. Additionally, the University of Washington acknowledges the Coast Salish peoples of this land, the land which touches on the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. Because this is a virtual session and we're all in different places, we encourage you to spend a little time later today learning about the land that you are on. We'll begin our program with short talks from our presenters followed by time for Q&A. We invite you to share questions you have for the presenters today using the Q&A feature and you can find that Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom toolbar. Feel free to to add any questions um, using Q &A, the Q&A feature at any point in the program. You can also share comments and responses today's, to, to, to today's presentation in, with us in the chat. Um, my colleagues Mel Desart, Kian Flynn, Madeline Munt, and Elliot Stevens will be monitoring your comments and questions and will be ready to share those with the presenters. A recording of today's event will be made available on the library's YouTube channel and closed captioning of this event is available by clicking on the CC button in the Zoom toolbar. And finally, as we engage together in this virtual environment today, we encourage you to abide by the library's code of conduct in engaging with panelists and with each other throughout the event. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the virtual mic over to Jake, who's going to kick off our panel presentation today. Thanks, Verletta. Um, I'm going to share my screen and show a few slides for a few minutes. Um, uh, and happy to take, you know, Q&A later, be interrupted and things like that. But uh, Verletta, please let me know when my, you know, seven, eight minutes are up. Um, so this, uh, I uh, figured might as well talk about, uh, given the election coming up and the importance of vote by mail, uh, some ongoing, some research uh, I and some co-authors have done on, uh, uh, with a large national voter file on the effects of vote by mail. Um, yeah, I'm just, I don't know, like, it's just a, quite an intense time leading up these next few weeks. So um, uh, happy to chat about really anything related to the election. Uh, in general, uh, the conventional wisdom on vote by mail is actually that it doesn't help young people as much and voters of color as much as older, whiter, uh, disproportionately homeowning um, and, uh, and somewhat wealthier individuals. But we looked at, we used a national voter file and exploited that what's considered by policy experts to be a strong implementation of vote by mail in Colorado in 20, uh, beginning in 2013, uh, uh, into the 2014 midterm elections and onward, they switched to all vote by mail, which we think is similar to the way states now are like California moving to all vote by mail. Um, Washington state has had it uh, uh, as well since 2011. Um, we use this national commercial voter file, which uh, allows us to really have records of every registered voter uh, in the US, uh, which is kind of cool and also kind of scary. 
Um, we do a traditional difference in differences design uh, uh, with things like exact matching based on people's past vote history and demographic factors to see whether the same people, once uh, Colorado implemented all male voting, increased their propensity to turn out to vote. And we found just a massive effect. We couldn't believe it, um, given that, uh, you know, changes, reforms to make voting easier tend to have small effects. So um, uh, changing registration laws, uh, the Motor Voter Act allowing registration at the DMV, these things uh, tend to have relatively small effects, but typically positive effects, making it easier to vote is tends to be good for turnout. But vote by mail, when you implement it statewide with strong investment from all levels of election administration, from the governor's office down to county election administrations, tends to work pretty well. And even more surprisingly, seems to work most for young people. So here we have a plot of the increased turnout effect based on people's generation, uh, their sort of cohort, birth cohort here. And the greatest generation of all time, the millennials, uh, appear to benefit the most uh, from the switch to vote by mail, which was really against conventional wisdom that young people like the fanfare of election day, voting in person, late stage advertising and social media, uh, you know, rock the vote campaigns and so forth. We actually found that young people, um, at least in Colorado's implementation, really benefited from vote by mail. Same thing against conventional wisdom, lower socioeconomic status individuals, uh, people with less education and uh, people of color appeared to increase their turnout most. Um, so this overall uh, sort of challenged our, our priors about uh, its effects across demographic groups. And then um, everyone remembers Donald Trump tweeting and uh, Republican elites suggesting that vote by mail was like a ploy by the Democrats to increase turnout for them, but not Republicans. Um, uh, it turns out that uh, we find that it increases turnout among people based on their partisanship of registration equally. But uh, in Colorado, this is, uh, we think this is because young people, especially, uh, register as independents. So I think this year, um, although in you know previous implementations of vote by mail, it's been a bipartisan sort of benefit. Group, every group has increased their turnout and election results have not shifted in terms of partisan balance as a result of vote by mail in the past. But this year, given the Republican Party's sort of criticism of vote by mail and you know uh, suggestion that it's fraudulent and uh, you know, a terrible process, Republicans appear less supportive of vote by mail for the first time ever in American history. There tended to be bipartisan support for vote by mail. And also it appears that Republican voters are slightly less, uh, are actually uh, opting in to vote by mail at lower rates than Democrats are this year, just given the sort of partisan signals of uh, the elites and uh, media. So we may, for the first time this year, see vote by mail benefit Democrats, but that remains to be seen. Um, uh, uh, in generally in a pandemic, it's critically important to, you know, implement vote by mail for obvious reasons. Um, and this is remarkably important for people who have, uh, had systematic historical marginalization from the electoral process in the U S. Um, at the same time, uh, Washington State, Colorado, these states are the gold standard of election administration in the U.S. at this point, where they had strong switches to all mail voting combined with ease of registration through same day voter registration and automatic voter registration when you move um, with an opt out system. And then you also are able to vote in person if all else fails, if you don't want to vote by mail or turn your mail ballot into a drop box. This is sort of the uh, gold standard. And I think moving forward, even knock on wood, when this pandemic finally ends, we should continue to uh, pursue sort of strong vote by mail policies like Washington State and Colorado. Um, thanks for your time. Thanks so much, Jake. If you have questions for Jake, feel free to put those in the Q&A feature um, right now. And we're going to transition over to Pratik, who is joining us. We're so grateful he's joining us from um, UC Berkeley today for this presentation. So turn it over to you. 
Hi everyone. Let me just go and share my screen. So hi all. Um, my name is Pratik. I'm a physics PhD uh, grad student at Berkeley, and I'm going to be talking about some work that I did this past summer with the University of Washington Data Science for Social Good program. Uh, in this project, my team and I helped develop an open source software package called Sky Compare with the aim of combating vote dilution and making every vote count. Uh, before we get started, I want to first acknowledge my wonderful teammates, Ari Hikari and Wandelin, who I worked with this past summer completely remotely. So as you may be aware already from recent press on partisan gerrymandering, voting systems can dilute minority voting power. Uh, and this vote dilution can come in a couple different forms. So let's set up an example here in our Voting population is 60% blue and 40% yellow. And as an entire group, they're looking to elect five individuals on, for example, a school board. Now in a non-diluted voting system, we separate our population, for example, horizontal wards, where we have two yellow wards that could elect two seats that are preferred by the minority candidate and resulting in this split. However, we can dilute this minority vote if we choose the voting system in a particular way. So first we could gerrymander by choosing districts that are in this case oriented vertically, uh, where the seats on the school board will all end up with a majority preferred candidate resulting in an entirely blue preferred uh, school board. In this particular case is called cracking. Another way to dilute the minority vote is with an at-large voting system shown on the right. And in this case, the, all, all voters vote for all seats on the school board. Uh, in this case, all the candidates could then be preferred by the blue population. And so voting dilution that ha impacts a racial minority's uh, uh, group's ability to gain representation is prohibited by the Voting Rights Act. And it occurs far more often than you think. And so how do we know when vote dilution actually happens? The Supreme Court developed a test to detect it called the Gingles test. And there are three criteria that must be met in order to prove vote dilution. First, the minority population has to be large and geographically compact. Secondly, minority voters have to be politically cohesive, meaning that they generally prefer the same candidate. And thirdly, majority voters in a block usually defeat the minority uh, preferred candidate. So majority voters are also politically cohesive in an opposite direction as the minority voters. Now, the tricky part of passing the Gingles test is parts two and three because it requires us to infer preferred candidates for specific voter blocks. So for example, let's consider an example election uh, and for two candidates A and B. And we know who, we know the turnout for different candidates shown here on the bottom, just by virtue of having access to the election results. And we know which voting blocks turned out because uh, as Jake mentioned, we can get that from the vote, voter files. So we know these cross tabulations on the side of this table, but what we really want is we want the voter preference by voting block. We want the inner parts of this table. And so we need to infer this and we, we don't have direct access to it because the ballot is secret in the United States. Luckily, we have a technique called ecological inference, which we can use to infer the estimated, uh, we can, which we can use to estimate preferred candidates by voting block. Now what EI does is it leverages the fact that election results are reported across many precincts or ecological units. So think about the elections you participate in. Your voting precinct might have a homogenous racial makeup, but at a different precinct somewhere else in your city, the racial makeup might be different. EI looks across all precincts in an election for patterns and uses these statistical regularities to estimate the numbers that'll end up going in this table. In non-statistical terms, if it appears consistently that precincts with more white voters also tend to yield more votes for a certain candidate, then ecological inference will very likely conclude that white voters prefer that candidate. So we have a pass forward to pass the Gingles test to assess whether vote dilution occurs. That's ecological inference. But in real life, there's a complicated data processing pipeline that goes from voter files and election results uh, to this an end result of ecological inference. And it's complicated and it's messy. And our goal this summer was to streamline this pipeline in the software package. This package called EI Compare performs end-to-end -end ecological inference. It's written in the R programming language 
uh, and help support uh, Gingles test analyses uh, in a variety of elections. Now, EI Compare was originally developed prior to the summer by our project leads for the summer. So this summer, we worked to expand its functionality, uh, add additional statistical robustness, and make it more accessible. If you'd like to check it out, it's available on CRAN and GitHub. So I want to end by showing you a case study of EI Compare being successfully used in the courtroom. We're going to be looking at East Ramapo School District that's shown in the red here, which is in Rockland County in the suburbs of New York City. Now, East Ramapo School District is heavily segregated, and it used an at-large voting system for its school board. That resulted in the school board, which was dominated by candidates preferred by the, by the majority bloc, in this case, which are white voters, as shown over the years on the right. Now, the New York ACLU and the NAACP brought a suit this past summer claiming that the at-large voting system diluted the vote for Black and Hispanic minority voters in the school district. Our project leads were expert witnesses in this case and used EI Compare to demonstrate the political cohesiveness of these blocks. Ultimately, the judge agreed with the EI Compare analysis that the Gingles test was passed and, it sh and she struck down the inequitable voting system. So what happened after that was that the judge ordered the system be switched to a ward system, which has nine seats, one for each on the school board. Now the plaintiff, the New York ACLU and the defendant, which is a school district, were required to propose new voting maps for the district. And so we have East Rampo School District that's once again shown in the right. And the New York ACLU, that's our map, proposed the map and the school district also proposed a map. Now, how can we look at these maps and tell which ones are ensuring adequate representation for minority voters? Uh, we know that even in a ward system, that can result in vote dilution. So what we're going to do is we're going to simulate a past election, for example, the 2018 election. We're going to run the election. We know which voters turned out and we know where they are. So we're going to see which, which, uh, in which wards the minority voters would have actually won a prefer a seat for their preferred candidate had the maps been in place at time to determine if vote dilution occurred. And so this was completely new functionality that we built into this package. And these are the results of our analysis. So what I'm showing here are the same maps as before that are color coded by minority vote turnout, the black and Hispanic minority voters in East Ramapo. And the, the color bar indicates the turnout. So I've outlined the districts, the wards in which the minority preferred candidate would have won a seat on the school board. In our map, that's three districts, one, two, and three, whereas the remaining districts were heavily dominated by white voters. In the school district map, only two seats would have been won by a minority preferred candidate. That's one and two. Whereas wards three and four have elevated uh, minority vote turnout, but not as much relative to the, uh, elevated more so relative to the remaining uh, wards, but not enough to guarantee a seat on the school board. So what happened on this map on the right? Why is there a discrepancy here? Well, if you look at Ward 3, this is an uh, area of high density uh, minority voters that turned out to vote. And this district is cracked into three different districts in the school district map, two, three, and four. So the minority vote was diluted into three different wards, resulting in decreased performance and uh, 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 turnout for, for decreased results in, in terms of their um, winning seats on the school board. So this evidence was recently presented to the judge in the ongoing court case, and she responded favorably toward our map. And so we don't really, we don't want to stop with East Ramapo. The census is happening right now for which the results will inform the drawing of new district lines at all forms of government in 2021. We anticipate that EI Compare is going to be heavily used in the multitude of impending voting, voting rights cases as new districting lines are tested for vote dilution. In an effort to support this, we spent a lot of time this summer meeting with a variety of stakeholders who all have a vested interest in supporting equitable districting. And we're hoping to carry forward these relationships as the fight for voting rights continues. I want to go and shout out our project leads, Matt Barreto at UCLA and Lauren Collingwood at Riverside, who's now at New Mexico, uh, and data scientists Spencer and Scott at UW who helped out this summer. Uh, and I want to thank you all for, for listening and encourage you all to, to vote, especially for your local elections. Thanks so much, Pratik. Such an inspiring project. 
um, I encourage you, if you have questions, to again submit those in the Q&A feature. And we're going to close our panel today with Emily. Hi everyone. Um, I want to thank everyone for uh, having me here to speak with you all. Uh, my name is Emily Willard. I am a uh, a recent graduate of the University of Washington. I got my PhD in international studies um, and just graduated in June. And for my five years at UW, I worked as a research fellow at the Center for Human Rights. Um, and previous to my time at UW, I uh, was a researcher at the National Security Archive, which is a non-governmental research institute uh, at the George Washington University Library in Washington, DC. Um, and I currently uh, work as a defense investigator with the King County Department of Public Defense. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about the Freedom of Information Act. Um, it's also known as the FOIA, F-O-I-A. Um, and uh, I think it fits very well with the topic of today because the Freedom of Information Act is a really strong component of a strong democracy. And uh, so the Freedom of Information Act is a law that was passed by the US Congress in 1966. And it gives all people, whether you're a citizen of the United States or not, whether you're located in the United States or not, gives everyone the right to access information from the US government. Um, and there's written into the law, there's uh, what we call presumption of disclosure in that we all have access to all government information, except in nine different situations. So there are nine different exemptions to the law. So for example, um, information could be withheld uh, from public access for national security reasons or personal privacy issues. Um, for example, like, you know, we wouldn't it wouldn't be good for national security to have the names and identities of CIA agents, for example, um, or the location of nuclear facilities, things like that. So um, the idea why I think the FOIA is so important is because it is an uh, important tool for we as people in the United States um, or around the world to uh hold the government accountable um so that there's someone kind of looking in watching what the government is doing and if you are a taxpayer you get to see what is being done with your taxpayer dollars um so it's a pretty common tool that's used by journalists um i kind of like to say that it's uh if people remember the wikileaks that happened about 10 years ago um, this is similar, but it's not a leak. It's using the laws to obtain access to information about the government. Um, and I think it really puts power in the hands of people. And of course, ultimately the government will decide whether or not they release the information. But I think there's still an important power in asking. Um, and the other thing I wanted to show you today um, as a resource, um, is uh, about a year ago, I worked with the UW libraries to, to create this um, press books. It's an ebook, and it's a guide about how to file Freedom of Information Acts um, requests. And so you can go in and it tells you kind of um, a background, kind of an introduction, sort of, sort of what I was explaining of why the FOIA is important. And then it gives a very detailed how to of if you wanted to file your own request, what you can actually do um, and how you submit it and where you submit it to. Um, and then it gives also a bunch of additional resources and references. Um, and the reason why I thought I felt very strongly and I was very happy to have the opportunity to do this book was because um, Pressbooks allows free and open access. So people are able to rework and reuse this book. Um, and I wrote it in a way that was very general so that people 
who are interested in different topic areas could tailor it to their own work. Um, so, for example, um, people who are interested in environmental activism, um, there are different groups that have used the FOIA to look at federal and local law enforcement coordination with the Dakota Access Pipeline. So groups were using the FOIA to get information um, about how the government was acting in response to those protests. Um, there's also been some good FOIA work done on racial justice topics. So surveillance of the Black Lives Matter movement, kind of getting a sense of what um, federal troops um, and different government agencies are doing. Um, here at the University of Washington, um, the Center for Human Rights has done a lot of work um, using the FOIA to advocate for immigrant rights. Um, and especially here in King County, if you all remember um, the ICE Air uh, report that came out that um, King County was deporting people from uh, using the municipal airport. Um, and then uh, another thing that um, the Center for Human Rights does is it uses the FOIA to get government documents about human rights atrocities uh, that happened in Latin America. So um, because the US government was so involved with um, the wars and conflicts that were going on in Latin America really started in a lot of times by the US, the US has an extensive amount of documents about what happened. Um, so I wanted to show you, this is a database that of documents that the Center for Human Rights gets about El Salvador and then has published them here with in partnership with the library. So if you're interested in what you can get from Freedom of Information Act requests or what the documents look like, um, again, free access here to anyone who is interested. Um, you can actually see the documents. And again, so I think um, why it's so important to have access to these, um, these documents, the way that they're published here, and then also with the press books, is that I think, um, and we're seeing right now with the response of educational institutions to the pandemic, that there are a lot of inequalities in access to information, access to resources, to knowledge. So that um, having these resources be available for free for people um, is something that I'm very passionate about. Um, and I think especially UW being a public institution has a responsibility and an opportunity to um, make this information available um, and supporting faculty and staff in writing their own FOIA requests. So um, while it's, uh, as an educational institution, um, it's relatively easy to get fee waivers so that you don't have to pay the search fees that kind of people or corporations who are just accessing information for themselves um, have to pay to do the FOIA. But as an educational institution, um, you can apply for fee waivers. Um, and then especially if you are then providing those documents to the public, um, you can actually do a great public service. So um, I think this is a really important tool to build, to work together to build a more just society. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. I could talk about this for hours, but I will leave it there. Thank you. All right, at this time, I'm going to invite you all to submit questions using the Q&A feature um, for our panelists. And I think uh, Madeline and Elliot may have some questions to kick us off. Great. Well, thank you so much for these really superb presentations. This was all just fascinating and wonderful. And it's such a treat to spend time with you and to learn about your work. Um, the first question that we have for you all um, is, um, for you, where is the line between research and activism? Or is there even a line? Is there, is there no line between those things? What a great question. Who was that? That was a great question. 
That was one, our team came up with that one. And so that's a please, yeah, that's for anyone else in the audience, idea. just click Q and A and get some questions in there. Cause I'm sure the audience has far better questions, but, but that's what we're just curious about as a team here initially. So my philosophy is uh, in typically quantitative social science, but also qualitative is that I'm a positivist when it comes to answering questions. So I do think there's like such a thing as accuracy about states of the world and philosophically potentially given social constructions, uh, objective reality. But the questions we ask and how we ask them is normatively driven by our ideological commitments um, that we, I think on this panel and I hold very deeply. For example, uh, issues of, you know, American democracy, racial justice and economic justice would be my, my list. Um, I'd like to add to that. I, I think a lot about, uh, I think a lot about this in terms of data science and how it intersects with uh, its impact on um, systems that influence people's lives. And there's a common argument for, or a common trope of like objective, being objective in, in data science or even science at large, which really doesn't have much meaning because either you be neutral, like at face value, which means that in, like you're okay with the status quo. It's a conservative position in the literal sense of conservative, that you're okay with the status quo and you're okay with in terms of the, the history that led up to the point that where we are now in terms of the, the system of power uh, and its allocation of resources and goods for, for people. Um, so I, I don't really see any point in being neutral or objective and really it's imperative to be a scholar activist uh, because the theories and tools that we develop will impact people's lives and if we don't take into consideration uh, the the courses in, uh, that, that led to it, the, the history that led to the social structures that we have now, then uh, we, we are only, we're just doomed to kind of enforce them uh, and keep them in place. So I love that, but I, I really want to jump in really quickly, if I may. So I actually think there is a positivist take that is exactly what you said so eloquently. So one example is in police reform, abolition, defunding, for example, an issue I am embedded in and participate in social movements in and so forth. So actually there's a, a in scholarship in quantitative social science, econ, poli sci, the worlds I come out of, there's a big push to, if we're gonna do some change to policing policy or criminal justice policy, we need to have a causally identified research to test the effects of that reform. But that's actually led to extreme status quo bias and we can't actually do a causally identified test of it turns out we've done reform after reform since the 1960s to try to reform policing it's become only more brutal and uh, institutionally racist since then and we can't test abolition or defunding like that's not a test you can randomly assign that's not a test you can do and for that reason Yes, the methodologies of quantitative social science are biased against it, which uh, the probably most uh, uh, robust thing we can do for racial justice in the US context. Um, at the same time, that doesn't mean there's not, like we couldn't in a different political system try it and test it and things, or that there's not a, a true effect of what these different reforms or abolition would do, but it's that we need to be extremely conscious of the ways in which quantification, the need for assessment um, and uh, metrics and so forth can uh, really be conservative and status quo biased. I would say I am I feel very strongly that uh, academics should be activists. Um, you know, at universities, professors and even graduate students, you know, as a graduate student myself, I saw, I thought, very much that my work um, was activist work, um, not only in communities that I served, but 
in the type of scholarship that I did. So I, I, you know, at University of Washington, I was exposed to a lot of um, indigenous studies and indigenous methodologies and theories that really changed my mind about what the purpose of academia even is or should be. And I feel very strongly that the universities in general have a lot of power, they have a lot of resources. And I think it is, um, I would say that not using those resources to, to turn and serve the community and make the world more just and equitable um, would be a misuse of those resources. Um, and there's a great, uh, I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but there's this great Latin American poet that writes about academics kind of just sitting, you know, debating philosophies while the world crumbles around them. And I think especially in our times right now, um, there is a massive amount of opportunity for academics to really make a difference, engage um, and really take the lead um, with partnerships with communities to make change. And um, there's a lot of examples just to tie back to my presentation of, I think using the Freedom of Information Act is a really important activism tool. Um, and I just shared with you a guide of how to do it. And my, I think my email address is in the guide. So if people have questions about how to use it in their work, um, I'm happy to work with people one-on-one -on -one, um, to expand usage of that. Well, fantastic. Um, this is a really interesting conversation. And please, those of you in the audience, um, any questions that come to mind, either pointed questions for specific presenters or questions that everyone could answer, please either put them in the chat or click Q&A and give us a question and, and we'll read it and we'll talk about it. Um, but before we get um, a question from the audience, another thing that we were wondering is that you all could have studied, researched, written about anything so what, what was it about voting or what was it about FOIA that that was what you wanted to study and that was what you wanted to research? And also kind of following up on that, what is it that makes you believe or gives you hope that you can improve voting or improve voting uh, FOIA to make these things more just? You guys got some great questions. Mm. Uh, I think, so I think my role and the role of a lot of scholar activists uh, is to subsidize activists. So I actually do believe that we as intellectuals have less influence over justice-based outcomes than organizers, participants in social movements, uh, you know, activists and whatever social movement. Um, I, and my role is to sort of uh, help to find uh, insights that may help them in producing social change. And I picked, you know, I, my development intellectually that in terms of realizing that it, I used to like when I was in undergrad and then early in grad, sort of as an undergrad, I thought, ah, if I simply wrote the right report that climate change is bad and think like, well, we will have this thing figured out. Like, but that's where we don't have an informational problem. Most of the social problems are facing the world are known. Um, and it's not an informational problem, but rather a power problem. So uh, uh, as intellectuals, we can assist in uh, building conceptualizations of goals and strategies of test, you know, helping to subsidize their sort of uh, movements and things like that, but we are not the major players. Um, for me personally, I'm, at a bit of a transition in my career. I'm a physics PhD student. I do research in theoretical neuroscience and now I'm trying to transition again into um, applications of, of data and machine learning in, in like a just manner and advocating against their misuse, which led to my interest in this program, the Data Science for Social Good program uh, at University of Washington. It's a great program. I don't know if there are any graduate students or undergrads or master's students in, in the audience, but I encourage you to apply to it. Um, ultimately, I, I developed a set of skills and, and technical and quantitative skills in graduate school with expertise in, in machine learning and, and working with data. And now, as Jake mentioned, the, the notion of being a scholar activist 
uh, kind of necessitated me or reorienting my application of those uh, skills and, and proper domains and advocating against their misuse as well. Um, so as you might be aware, things like facial recognition uh, are, are in the press a lot these days. And, and as experts, we, we have a role to play in serving as, as, as a, the providing expertise against uh, uh, abstaining from misuse of, of certain technologies. Um, in terms of voting, there's a well-established set of uh, tools that have been used, at least in this domain of voting rights, uh, for vote dilution. Um, so a lot of the stuff I talked about in, in the talk are kind of old techniques, and it's been a lot of like trying to make that transparent and open and easily accessible to people. Um, not uh, not as much as offering expertise, but connecting people to like these techniques and, and making it accessible to a wider group of people. Thanks for the question. Um, I could have a really long answer about uh, why I'm passionate about the FOIA, but a really simple version um, is that it's been a large part of kind of the trajectory of my life and um, studying abroad in Latin America, especially Santiago, Chile, and learning about the role of the United States in supporting and facilitating a lot of the dictatorships and kind of fomenting the a lot of the conflicts and wars and thousands, hundreds of thousands of people's deaths and disappearances. Um, growing up, I didn't know about any of that. And I, once I started learning more about Latin American history and the role of the United States, I felt very strongly about more people need to know about this and the importance of holding the US government accountable. And uh, my first job at the National Security Archive uses the Freedom of Information Act to hold the US government accountable. And I worked on the Guatemala, El Salvador and Mexico projects. And what gives me hope is very connected to that. Um, Cause about 11 years ago, when I started doing this research, I um, the first thing I started working on was investigating um, the uh, this one um, massacre that happened of Jesuit priests in El Salvador by the El Salvadorian military. And one of the people we were investigating was um, a former military official named Inocente Orlando Montano. And uh, long story short, you can go look it up in the news, um, but he was eventually, um, just a, a month or two ago, he was found guilty of his involvement in that massacre in the national court in Spain through a bunch of different legal tools. He ended up facing trial there. And um, it was key to have to his, um, conviction was declassified documents. Um, and to me that, you know, the process took 11 years. And as someone who works in public defense, of course, like I have complicated feelings about criminal justice systems, even the international justice system. But for me, the effect that it's had on people, um, family members of um, people who died in massacres at the hands of this person, um, that it it's very powerful for them to feel a sense of justice and resolution. So that's what gives me hope is that it may take decades sometimes, and you might be little chipping away, but the people who suffered most from the atrocities, um, I think are, are finding resolution and um through that they are also doing um you know building better futures for their families and their children so um i think it can be a daunting task to hold the government accountable but if we don't ask i mean what it, if we don't ask for records and we don't try to hold the government accountable and we don't look for ways to publish them and share like it just happens in a dark room and the government continues to get away with it so um yeah, I could I could go on for a long time, but I'll end it there. Thank you. I think actually maybe we should pursue 
that idea further, Emily, because I think we can talk a little bit more about hope here. I mean, part of the reason why we are calling this event Open Democracy is because we're in Open Access Week. And so open, capital O, open, that could be like open access materials online. That could be open source code that people can use to make things. That could be open educational resources. I mean, you made a press book. It's an, it's an open resource that others can consult or maybe even remix and change. And so can we take this concept of like open, like capital O open in the world of like this kind of technology sphere and spheres, but can we also think of like open as like, like transparent, trusting, caring. I mean, can we, is there, I, I guess going, I don't, this isn't really a fully formed question, but somehow I wanna take these technological ideas of openness and combine them with democracy. Um, and I'm wondering just how do you do that? Like, how do you combine all these concepts? Or instead of asking you if you have hope for a capital O open democracy, I kind of wonder like, instead of asking if you have hope, like what are your hopes? What what do they look like and how do you intend to realize them? Yeah, it's a great call. A couple of things on voting, like it should be uh, your registration status, the status of your ballot, all these things should be absolutely open. The how to vote should be transparent. The election administration in the US is, is an international, it's, pathetic in comparative terms um, and openness with the capital O is a good uh, sort of route to travel down. But Protic has some really important things about algorithmic bias and the uh, that is mentioned and thinking about how opaque and obscure those systems are where then uh, large firms, different actors will come and say, ah, we've developed a new tool that, you know, will enhance profit making and potentially some automate some outcomes such as bail decisions on who to grant bail. Um, and that it's a really crucial task for quantitative social scientists and hard scientists to uh, investigate uh, sources of bias within these models and to normatively and philosophically address whether we want, you know, whether minority report, thought, these sorts of uh, future things are normatively desirable, so philosophy of science, um, but then also the algorithmic bias is just classic where for a number of like, including sort of liberal criminal justice reformers thought these algorithmic bail decisions were brilliant. And then it turned out like, like, ah, if you grew up in a place that's poor, blacker and higher crime and like, you're less likely to get bail. And then same thing, uh, um, you know, like, if you didn't want my, you know, model to classify you as a criminal, maybe try to uh, be a different skin tone than the like workers that we hired to do the training data set think is associated with criminality and things like that. It's like these are algorithms have not, uh, you know, overcome any source of uh, institutional, structural and psychological forms of, for example, racism, but this goes much deeper. But that's an example where where social scientists and scientists can really play a role and our, our like expertise, the extent we have it can play a role. It, just to add on to that, uh, Jake brought a lot of what's been discussed uh, in machine learning and, and AI recently in terms of how that field thinks it needs to intersect with the remaining social structures in, in, in the world. And, and there's a, in the past few years, I'm, I'm hopeful because in the past few years, this has been a lot more um, engagement and a little bit more self-awareness in terms of how this field thinks about how it in, in, interacts with, with these kinds of systems. Um, that being said, there is a, like a disconnect between, uh, you know, Think, developing theories and, and thinking about how how these systems interact and how they should interact and maybe advocating against their use or improper use and overcoming the inertia of established systems and uh, like the deployment of, of, of proper deployment of good systems. For, uh, I'm, I'm thinking in the context of like technical systems that rely heavily on, on these kinds of algorithms, um, but it's more general than that. Uh, and so I still am, Still, I'm waiting to see how people think about like the overcome that kind of inertia, uh, the institutional inertia that that drives the status quo. 
uh, and whether um, it, it really does require like overhauling of systems and, and whether that can actually happen. Um, for me, thank you for that question, Elliot. Um, uh, one of the things that I was looking at for my dissertation research, and even um, when I was teaching in classrooms, um, was this, these ideas of knowledge production. And again, it was very much informed by indigenous study scholarship, but an I, the ideas around like who gets to produce knowledge, how is it valued? Um, and I think in academia, it's very hierarchical and actually a project that I'm working on um, with undergraduates right now is finding a way for undergraduates to cite their own personal or family experiences in their research papers because um, as a teaching assistant grading I came into problems you know when I'm teaching a class on human rights in Latin America and students either grew up or have family members in Latin America who experienced these human rights violations, how like, but there, there's not a structure or a format for them to cite that evidence of lived experience. Um, and I ran into that as this problem that I wasn't sure how to navigate in being like fair and equitable to other students. Like you have to learn how to cite, you know, sources, but how do you cite yourself as a source? So um, I, with, uh, undergraduates developed um, a set of citation guidelines that uh, we're working on an article to hopefully publish it soon. Um, and it really challenges this idea uh, that only the small like group of people way at the top have the authority to produce knowledge. And that's what excites me with things about like the press books and the Freedom of Information Act is that's all about kind of like, yes, it's about transparency openness, but it's also about open source openness. So how can we kind of democratize knowledge, basically? And I think the Pressbooks tool and the Freedom of Information Act are really good ways to try to democratize knowledge um, so that more people's ideas are valued and that we get to learn from and share information. And exactly what Elliot was saying is, the idea with the press books in general, but especially the one I created is that people can use it, learn from it, rework with work it, and then share to their other people so that it's this continuous ripple effect that, you know, and that's why I was so passionate about working at the Center for Human Rights. Um, and I helped set up the FOIA program there and wanted to teach more undergraduates and anyone who wanted to learn how to do the FOIA. I think the more we can access information and share it with others and the tools of how to obtain it, that's a way to democratize knowledge. And that seems like a wonderful note to end on. Thank you, Emily. Um, I want to give some, a virtual round of applause to all of our presenters, Jake, Pratik, uh, Emily today for sharing your work and giving us hope in a more equitable and open democracy. Um, I want to thank everybody who took the time out of your busy schedules to attend today and help us celebrate Open Access Week. Um, thank you all and have a wonderful afternoon.